Hello, everyone. We're going to get started. Um, first of all, welcome and happy Women's Month. As we wrap up March, I just want to thank you all for attending all of our events and supporting IWL. We really appreciate it. And thank you so much for being here tonight as our Heinz cohort has their Heinz presentation about the impact and the effectiveness of the IWL. My name is Annie McGuire, and I am the Heinz Scholar Coordinator here at the IWL. So before we get started, I'm going to start with our land acknowledgement. Both the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University occupy the original homelands of the Dakota and Anishinaabe peoples. We honor, respect, and acknowledge the indigenous peoples forcibly removed from this territory, whose connection remains today. St. Benedict's Monastery and St. John's Abbey previously operated boarding schools for Native children. Now students, faculty, and staff are working to repair relationships with our Native nation neighbors. Each year, um, sophomore CSB students have the opportunity to apply to become a part of the Heinz Scholars, a year-long cohort-based program that explores gender and leadership. This cohort commits to personal exploration and reflection, scholarship, and dialogue on topics of gender, leadership, social, social justice, and identity. The Heinz Scholars is a meaningful opportunity to learn, grow, be challenged, and build lasting relationships with peers. At the end of this unique experience, the Heinz leave with a clear vision about how they wish to shape the world around them and continue to grow the skills they have learned within the cohort. Each year, the Heinz scholars research and present a project as a culmination of their work in the cohort throughout the year. This year, our eight Heinz scholars researched and explored the impact and efficacy of the Institute for Women's Leadership as an organization in honor of the 20 years of IWL. They did this by looking at the history of the IWL, its current role on campus, and the Heinz scholars' recommendations for the future. Um, as you will see throughout the presentation, these scholars conducted interviews, took a deep dive into the archives here on campus, created a survey for the public to voice their thoughts and opinions, and more to answer the question of how effective IWL is in fostering growth, leadership, and a sense of belonging in Benny's and CSBSJU students. I would like to thank everyone who helped throughout this project to make it happen. Thank you to everyone who interviewed with the scholars and took our survey. Um, thank you to AV support for being here tonight to film this presentation. Um, thank you to IWL staff and advisors for helping throughout this whole process. Um, to Peggy and everyone at the archives for helping us out um, and with all the resources they provided for us. And a special thank you to our faculty advisor, Dr. Shannon Smith, for your help, advice, and dedication throughout this project. We could not have done this without any of you, so thank you so much. So this presentation is broken up into three sections to sh showcase our research. This will allow us to look at the past, present, and future of the IWL in order to fully communicate the results of this extensive project. At the end of each section, there will be an allotted amount of time to discuss the information presented as well as your, our, your own experiences to help and um, with the help of some guiding questions. So without further ado, please help me in welcoming our amazing Heinz Scholars. Hi everyone, my name is Rachel Iden. And my name is Amanda Martinez. And the first section we will be going over is the past. We will be giving you a brief history of the Institute for Women's Leadership that we compiled from interviews, the CSP archives, online collections, and the IWL website. We will be highlighting important steps along the way of creating a women's center on campus here and how the IWL today began to, began to be. Um, so to start off, when you go onto the IWL website, this is the timeline of the center that they provide. Um, it starts in 2003 with the proposal and support from the Board of Trustees. Then in 2004, the construction began in February and it opened in March. And in 2007, it was dedicated to Sister Nancy Hines. And then in 2009, the name changed to the Institute for Women's Leadership. This is a pretty simple outline of IWL's history, but we will be going a little bit more in depth. As you might imagine, especially since St. Ben's is a women's college, there were people interested in women's leadership before 2003. 
Some examples that we found in the archive include the Women's Leadership Training Institute in the early 90s that focused on helping CSB students develop leadership skills through this training program that had eight different sessions that totaled to about 20 hours of training. This was the pamphlet for it. Um, or in the mid-90s with the Women's Development Working Group, a group of students, faculty, staff, and administrators that researched women's development and gender and leadership and how they affect one another. And this was the beginning of their research paper from that. And in 1998, Molly Oberweiser even proposed a women's center for campus. She wrote a proposal stating that, quote, a women's center on our campus would enhance CSB's vision and practice of valuing women, end quote. At this point in time, many other colleges and universities already had women's centers, so students such as Molly began wondering why, as a women's school, CSB didn't have one. In an interview with Molly, she stated, quote, I don't remember the interse intersectionalities of gender being talked about much, and I don't remember race being talked about. I don't remember sexual orientation being talked about. I don't remember, like, conversations around, around paternalism or things like that. She noticed this on campus, and her proposal sought to address some of those issues. Her, pro her proposal contained a three-year plan placing emphasis on rape and sexual assault prevention, alcohol abuse, eating disorder education, and lastly, creating a safe environment for LGBTQ plus students on campus. Molly's proposal did not go anywhere, but it is an example of a student on campus wishing for a space like the IWL to exist to dis discuss topics as such. Jumping a few years ahead to 2003, this is where the IWL that we know today really began. In an interview with Mary Geller, who is the current Associate Provost for Student Success, former advisor of the IWL, and currently sits on the advisory board, we learned that it all started when she sent Beth Heinesen to a student leadership conference, and while there, she drafted an idea for the, a center for women at CSB. Once returning from the conference, she paired up with Sarah Summers to try to accomplish this goal alongside Mary Geller, and at the time, there was a series of women speakers that would visit campus called the Women's Live Series, but they weren't always the type of speaker that students wanted to see. They thought if they combined this speaker series with a student-run group on campus, then they could have speakers and other programming that the students would think is more relevant. In the fall of 2003, Beth and Sarah wrote out a sketch of what the center would be, which is pictured on the right there. Um, they also hosted a planning meeting for the center that was open to the whole student body to, to gauge what students would want to see from the center, but also get more students involved in leadership roles. Beth went abroad in the spring of 2004, so the main leadership role was then handed off to Lisa Baker. In an interview with Mary Geller, she said, quote, we got pushback at the time because there were two schools of thought. One is we were a college for women, so our whole institution was a center for women. And we determined that simply by saying we were a college for women wasn't enough. This was really a place where women could find their voice, where they could express themselves and be in a safe circle, end quote. So developing the center was faced with some pushback, yet they had approval and a group of students that did think this would better the lives of students on campus and they moved forward. This slide shows on the left a flyer advertising the planning meeting that was held in December that was open to anyone and asks, are you interested in women's development and do you want to see more issues addressed that pertain to you? On the top right is the initial reasons why, the vision and the mission proposed by Beth and Sarah. Um, and the bottom right has proposed events and topics to address, including how to be a leader, feminism, the women in the, women in the workplace, politics, and athletics, a lot of which the IWL still discusses today. And I want to point out that although leadership hasn't entered the name yet, it is still at the top of topics that they wanted to cover. This slide shows the progression of the mission statements um, from 2003 to 2004. It started as, quote, to provide a place where women can collaborate to explore and define themselves through inclusive dialogue, reflection, and ethical acts. And it changes to include empowering women and celebrating and recognizing women as shapers of our world. And you can see that the bold and the underlined areas are what still is maintained in the mission statement that the IWL has today. Um, 
Um, moving on to 2004, in February, they were in the quiet phases of being opened, as described by Mary Geller to the faculty, with Lisa Baker as the student coordinator. On March 29th, the CSB Center for Women officially opens, which is the flyer on the right, uh, with a ceremony and their first event. Over the summer, Beth was hired as a student, as the student, co student director, my apologies, um, and that fall they formalized Hot, hot Chocolate Hot Topics, which was a monthly discussion of controversial topics with a professor, and this was a staple of their early programming. They also decided to change Women's Week to Women's Month in time for March of 2005. Um, here are a few more images of the grand opening from the record on the left and from St. Benedict's Magazine on the right, as well as um, an advertisement for their first event, The F Word. Um, this slide shows the program ideas that they had in 2004, a lot of which still exist in some format today, um, including Women's Month, book clubs, panels and forums, first-year mentoring programs, and keynote speakers. Um, this shows some early advertisements for some of their events, although I would argue that the graphics have improved the core idea of educating students on topics that are prevalent in their life um, remains today with the IWL. And this slide shows some events from the first two Women's, Month on, women's Months on campus. Um, the left side is from the record for one of the keynote speakers in 2005. And then the two images on the right um, show like a more robust plan for Women's Month in 2006. All right, so on September 16th of 2007, the Center for Women was dedicated to Sister Nancy Hines and became the Sister Nancy Hines Center for Women. This was due to her dedication to the women's movement and her activism concerning women's issues. Alexa Gallet, a former director and graduate from 2007, said this during her speech at the dedication. Being here at St. Ben's, we truly know what it means to be a woman, and that is a source of power. We are very proud to be dedicating the center in your honor. We hope to continue the work you have started for many years to come. It wasn't until two years later, in the summer of 2009, that the Sister Nancy Hines Center for Women became the Sister Nancy Hines Institute for Women's Leadership. In an email from Carrie Vandelak, who was the student director at that time, and Mary Geller to faculty and staff, they said, the Center for Women went through this change for a number of reasons. Mainly, restructuring and renaming the Center for Women to the Institute for Women's Leadership allows us to place a strong focus on enhancing the leadership abilities of CSB women. In our interview with Carrie, she said, the name change came about because of the focus on leadership. I know traditionally a lot of women's centers focus on things like domestic violence, and especially years ago, that's kind of what the main focus of women's centers was. But at St. Ben's, this shift was just made to focus really more on leadership and to kind of meet the students where they're at. Not that we didn't address any other concerns, but yeah, just shifting the focus that way. This is reflected through another mission statement change, which was in August of 2009, and it reads, to empower women to become leaders in communities, locally and globally, by inspiring inclusive dialogue, reflective thinking, and ethical action that celebrates and recognizes women as shapers of our world. From that same email, they highlight new programming such as Women as Global Leaders and Women's Expeditions, which include trips and outdoor excursions, Lunch with a Leader, and Women's Month. They said, although we are embracing a new mission and new programs, the structure of the Institute for Women's Leadership will remain the same as the structure of the Center for Women. In the record, Carrie is quoted saying, with this change, there is some confusion with the students, but the main goals stayed the same and the name now reflected the mission of developing leaders on campus. This is a pamphlet from early after the name change highlighting available programming. So this was programs from the late like 2000s to the early 2000s and 2010s, which had speakers that students viewed as strong leaders. In 
In our interview with Mary Geller, we asked her to give us more insight into what representation looked like at the formation of the Center for Women and how it changed into the IWL that we know today. She replied, when we first started, we looked at the three waves of feminism. It, the IWL, was pretty white because it represented our campus. Over time, we have really embraced the fourth wave of feminism. We've embraced intersectionality. We've become so much more sophisticated in what defines a woman. Now we wanted to highlight the ways in which the IWL has expanded their leadership structure to be more inclusive. So in 2013 and 14, the intercultural women's rep position was created and this ensures that IWL programming is representative of all Bennies on campus. And then in 2014 and 15, the IWL added the Heinz Scholar Coordinator position into their board. Then moving to the 2016-2017, the IWL created a social justice coordinator position, focuses on social justice issues and improving campus culture. And then finally in 2019-2020, the climate justice coordinator position was created to bring awareness to climate justice issues and how we, as a school, can advocate for change in social, racial, and environmental issues. Sydney Robinson, an alum from 2018, who also serves as the Diversity and Inclusion Program Manager at CSPSJU and the Direct Supervisor for the IWL, um, is the closest member on staff that works to the IWL. And although they never held a leadership position in the IWL as a student, Sydney has been able to see how the program has developed over the years, and they had this to say. Working more with them, the IWL, and seeing some of the work, like what the intercultural rep very specifically was doing, and then once I moved into making sure that they became more intersectional and working with different identities, the IWL slowly became less white and more intersectional and representative of what women at St. Ben's do truly represent and care about. We also wanted to explore the effectiveness of the IWL in developing leaders, and so through this we gathered research and survey results, but we also interviewed past IWL alums. And so we wanted to highlight some former student leaders that we interviewed, and we wanted to observe how they reflect the mission of the IWL in their careers. So first we have Molly Oberweiser, who drafted the first proposal for a center for women. Um, and they're now the co-founder of With the End in Mind, a consulting business that partners with organizations and institutions who are working to implement racial and equity lens. Um, they're also an adjunct professor at Portland State University in their social work program. And then Beth Heinzen, who proposed a Center for Women in 2003 and also worked as the student director from 2004 to 2005, now works at the Young Entrepreneurs Academy of Baton Rouge inspiring youth to follow their dreams and create their own businesses. And then finally, we had the honor of speaking with Danny Voss, a, re a recent graduate and the creator of the climate justice representative position for the IWL. Um, and they are now the culinary youth manager at Green Garden Bakery, whose goal is to support the leadership development, community engagement and economic mobility of youth in North Minneapolis. And they mentioned what's been helpful for being a leader outside of school has just been being really confident um, in my own voice. I definitely found value in my worth and knowing from my time on campus. In our interview with Carrie, she also said, the IWL was the best part of my college experience by far. It's just an amazing place and I hope that it continues to grow and change and address the needs of students and to continue to be student led. So as we can see, our past IWL alums have pursued careers where they can lead and collaborate and create impact in their communities in the same way that the IWL does. All right, thank you so much for listening to the past section. Here are our discussion questions. Um, let's take five minutes and just speak to those around you about a question that stands out to you or all three questions. And then after that, we're gonna move on to the next portion of our presentation. Thank you. Awesome, thank you guys for um, engaging in the questions. My name is Jacqueline Chavez. Hi, my name is Betty Garcia Herrera. I'm Gabby Perez Sanchez. And we're the prison group. So I would like to foremost introduce the current IWL staff um, and their positions. 
So starting off with Julia Geller as the student director, Taylor Ryder as the PR coordinator, Annie McGuire, Heinz Scholar Program Coordinator, Liz Pineda, Intercultural Women's Representative, um, as the Program Coordinator, Ellie Schmatz in the fall semester, and Dana Alcala in the spring semester, um, Marik Hermerdern, um, Climate Justice Coordinator, um, Lexi Horner, Social Justice Coordinator, and Annika Gothman as the Community Engagement Coordinator. Let's give another round of applause to them. What an awesome group of staff that we have. So with that, let's just take a moment and hear about the IWL um, from their staff in their interviews. So first off, um, there's a quote by Cindy Robinson. She said, if you teach a man to read, he'll get a job. But if you teach a woman to read, you'll feed a village. And I think that that's what the IWL has done. It's been feeding the village of St. Ben's. Then we have Julia Geller, which said, um, because at the end of the day, we're here to advocate for all Bennies, regardless of affiliations, no matter what, it's what to talk about. Then we have Lexi Horner, who said, the biggest thing to know is that anything we want to change, we did. You want to rest uh, restructure the coordinator roles? We changed it. If you want to do something, let's do it. Anything we want to change, we made it happen, and that's the beauty of being a student-run, student-led organization. You want to change it, you can. Before we get started into the information about the survey, let's just get a quick description of what we did for the survey. We first brainstormed and made a list of questions of what we want to know about the about um, CSB and SJU students and how they viewed IWO AW, as a whole. We also were interested in how the IWO impacted their respected communities and learned more on the intersectionality here on campus. The survey was then distributed through many ways like IWL's Instagram um, within in the individual classes and connected with professors and flyers. There are two things to know about the survey. Um, one is that it is important to know that these responses were um, completely anonymous and respecting the identities of the students. Two, the text box responses were not required, meaning um, the students had the option to respond to the questions. Three, we only had a total of 90 students responding to the survey. And lastly, four, we use convenient and snowball effect strategies. Now that we have a quick description of what the survey was, let's jump into the actual results. So for the demographic section, at the view of the participation, we collected over 90 participants from the CSB SJU students, CSB SJU alums, and IWL previous and present staff. We believe we had an excellent outcome for the amount of results that we received in the duration of the survey being available. As we can see in figure one, uh, the leading gender that participated heavily in the IWL survey were cis females as we received 74 votes nine votes from cis males, and four votes in the other category. It's also important to note that the other category included other genders like trans male, trans female, and non-binary and genderqueer. Continuing on to figure two, we are going to examine the participation race slash ethnicity votes we received from the IWL survey. As we can see, the majority of the respondents classified themselves as white at the count of 63, while the second ranking we received was the, was the ethnicity of Latinx at the count of 16. Participants that classified themselves as black slash um, African American were at the count of four. In our other category, we received one vote of race and four votes of ethnicity. And the respondents that we received in the other category were participants classifying themselves as Bahamian. When making the survey, we wanted to highlight these three themes, um, developing leadership skills, understanding the mission, and understanding gender issues. Um, especially how it was affecting the campus um, culture because they're as associated with also the IWL's vision, which is the Sister Nancy Hines Institute for Women's Leadership seeks to provide a forum where women in this community of learners can explore and articulate their per personal and professional aspirations to lead and transform communities in ways that allow all to reach their fullest potential. Um, so starting off with development of leadership skills was figuring out what works for their personality and style and expanding on those innate qualities. 
Panel events have been the most impactful way that those skills have, were portrayed because they describe a better definition of what a leader is. For example, not just giving orders. It's involved, being involved in a team, helping others, giving them motivation and guiding them. Um, being able to listen to many of the panel events where Bennies describe their experiences. It doesn't matter what event, but being able to see those women being spotlighted, we're able to see the representation. Um, going off with representation, being able um, to see them in higher positions give women hope for they can be them one day. Switching up to the next theme, which was understanding the mission. The mission statement supports the vision and ser serves to communicate purpose and direction to the students. As it, said, as it was said before, the mission is to engage the in to empower women to become local and global leaders by engaging in inclusive dialogue, reflective thinking, and values-based leadership that celebrates and recognizes women as shapers of our world. Many were able to understand the women's IWL mission statement because of the type of events that were hosted, the audience that were, they were trying to achieve, and the goals they were wanting to achieve. The final common theme in the survey was being able to understand the different gender issues there are. For example, um, seeing the typical stereotypes that only white males are seen in higher positions or in positions of power. IWL has been able to raise awareness by collaborating with other e clubs, organizations like CERTs, by educating people about these issues that many others shy away that they have been able to make space for women. So we want to also make you all aware that the structure of our survey for these three themes was by agree, strongly agree, disagree, and strongly disagree. But going off from that, we can see that 70% of students that filled out the surveys data that they str strongly agree and agree that they were able to gain an understanding of gender-related issues from IWL. There is still room for improvement, and it's important to understand the gender issues because of the Institute's women's leadership. Its mission is to f for women to feel represented and for people to be aware of what's going on behind the scenes specific to specific gender. And 76% said that they understood the mission of the IWL's events. We believe that this is because of the lack of announcement, maybe repeating the mission every time a IWL event is hosted, like the land acknowledgement, so others are aware of their mission. 51% expressed their development of leadership skills was from the IWL. This was the lowest percentage that students felt comparing to all three themes. We can see that this is because they probably developed leadership skills from somewhere else, but it doesn't mean they don't have it. Looking at the statistics overall, it's statistically supported that IWL is doing a great job. Although not all students that took the survey gained an understanding of these themes, we want to highlight that more than half of them gained, what they gained was gained from IWL. Um, okay, on to representation. Um, in our IWL survey, we gave the participants three statements that would help us give us the image of how strong the practice of inclusivity is shown in the history of IWL. Each question had the following options to choose what they believe suited best. The options were strongly agree, agree, strongly disagree, and disagree. Our first statement that we gave our um, participants was, my gender identity is represented IWL programming. And we received 86 strongly agree, agree votes, while five selected strongly disagree, disagree. We are able to conclude that 95% of the, the respondents feel their gender identity is represented. Our next statement was my gender, well, I apologize. Um, <laughs> our next statement was my racial and ethnic identity is represented IWL programming. And we received 80 votes of strongly agree, agree, and 11 strongly disagree, disagree votes. All students identifying as Hispanic slash Latinx responded agree or strongly agree. All students identifying as black responded disagree or strongly disagree, resulting in seeing that 70% of students of color feel their ethnic and racial identity is represented. 
Our last final statement given in the survey was, my sexual identity is represented in IWL programming. And we received 80 votes of strongly agree, agree, and 11 strongly disagree, disagree votes. We concluded that all students identifying as bisexual responded agree or strongly agree. All students identified, identified as lesbian responded disagree or strongly agree, disagree. Um, from this data, we can see that 70% of LGBTQ plus students feel their sexual identity is represented. This data was collected in the 2023 Heinz Scholar Research Survey, courtesy of the Institute of Women's Leadership at the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University. It's also important to note that these statistics do not represent every demographic that we studied. We just pulled out statistics that show significant patterns related to the representation and inclusion. Also, these results do not represent the opinions of all students with these identities, just those who completed our survey. The main thing to note from these results is that while the issues of representation is complex, there are students who do not feel represented in the IWL programming, mostly those from marginalized identities. So in future programming, we want to work intentionally to create inclusion, and we will talk more about this later specifically in the presentation. Also with the survey, we saw um, the event attendance based on what the respondents have said. Um, so about um, 42 respondents attended one to three events, 10 respondents um, attended six or more events, four to six events, only 11 respondents um, responded to that, and then 27 respondents um, said that they attended none. With also the attendance of the events, we also looked at the impact left on the students attending these events. And then we see here that 33 respondents uh, said that all events they attended were impactful. 27 respondents stated that more than half of the events they attended were, um, were impactful. Seven respondents stated that less than half of the events uh, they attended were impactful. And then leaving the rest of the 23 respondents who said that none of the events were impactful. If we, as, we, if we assume that those students that didn't attend events were the ones who said that it wasn't impactful for them, um, the people who did attend did have a long-lasting impact. Okay. So these are the things IWL is doing great according to the survey. People find many events impactful, helps people understand gender issues, and making the organization inclusive, representing everyone, gender, race, and ethnicity. Also, according to the survey, ways to improve are more promotion, advertising on events, um, be more reflective on underrepresented students, SJU, faith out, SJU outreach, and making events more accessible. So there was a, a variety of responses of how people felt about the IWL. Based on the data of the survey, we found out the strengths and ways of improvement as we just now heard. So how can the IWL continue to help? Uh, we found out that attendance does matter. So let's just take, some, uh, take a look at some of the testimonies from the survey from those who have attended. So how does the IWL impact campus culture? Um, one responder said, in many ways, community building for Benny's a safe space. As another one said, by providing very helpful and necessary events and programming to inform campus about women and gender issues. Create a voice of women within CSB SJU that is actually heard. Here are a few more who went into depth. Um, this person wrote, IWL is extremely impactful to the betterment of students' understanding of gender empowerment. As historically women's college, they show an immense amount of dedication, dedication towards catering to students' needs and encouraging all Bennies to be their best. And lastly, we have, I think the IWL helps Bennies have a place in leadership on campus. Students see feminism gender, and gender issues as something to take seriously because of how well respected the institute is on campus. Additionally, advocacy, advocacy work such as the Pat Hall protest helps to give women a voice in campus issues. Now that we heard um, and taking a look about the results, we have these two discussion questions and um, based on your thoughts of what you saw here. All right.
right. Hello, everyone. My name is Grace Yash. I'm Ileana Martinez. And I'm Maddie Lenius. And now that we've discussed the past 20 years of the IWL, we want to look forward and imagine what the IWL could look like 20 years from now. In analyzing the results of our survey and interviews, we found three key categories regarding recommendations for the future of IWL, connections, events, and inclusivity. And here you can see a preview of what we will be discussing in the next few minutes. Beginning first with connections, we found a common theme in our conversations regarding what makes the IWL effective was the ability to build and sustain connections across campus. I will be looking at the idea of making connections within the IWL as a team, between the IWL and its participants, and between the IWL and other student organizations on campus. Some key strengths within the IWL team as observed by current staff members, alums, and participants include being woman and student-led and strong interpersonal connections within the staff. Some areas for improvement are participant connections to IWL staff and increasing avenues for involvement. Lexi Horner described the strength of the IWL as noted by the present group saying, that's the beauty of being a student-run, student-led organization. You want to change it, you can. We found that people value the role of, of the IWL in recognizing the power of students to shape the spaces we occupy and influence and giving students the platform to lead conversations about campus culture and social change. In addition to the benefit of being student-led, there is also value in being woman-led. Molly Kennedy shared that if we're not in conversation with each other and able to ground into our lived experiences, into our values, into what it's like to navigate this world and to receive that validation, to be seen, heard, and valued, if we aren't able to have that space, it's so easy for us to be fragmented, divided, and pulled in different directions. Having a space for women to share in community is valuable in empowering women to be leaders and shapers of our world. Another strength of the IWL is the interpersonal staff connections it fosters. Current and former IWL staff members shared that the IWL provided them encouragement, empowerment, confidence, and hope, noting, this job has helped me become better at accepting praise. I definitely found my way here because someone believed in me, and I want to make sure I continue that too. Working at IWL, you learn to become very confident in yourself because you were chosen for a reason. And finally, we are so creative as a collective that there is no challenge that students can't really grasp and address. Moving on to the connection between the IWL staff and participants, we noticed a trend in our survey data of students searching for increased opportunities to connect with IWL staff members. Respondents shared that the IWL should start to close the gap between staff and participants in events, increase transparency of group members, including who they are and what they can do for the Benny community, and feature more ways for participants to better know the staff and be able to provide suggestions for future programming and events. One way this could be improved in the future is an institutional change involving reworking the physical space dedicated to the IWL. Currently, their small office in the corner of the Multicultural Center isolates the work of the IWL and does not effectively foster campus connections. Many of our survey respondents appreciate the work the IWL does and want to see more opportunities for involvement. Responses indicated that the IWL should create a way for people to be involved without having to work for the IWL, have more leadership opportunities, include non-staff members in planning programming, and hold more interactive events overall. Current student director of the IWL, or sorry, lastly, an important area of connection identified in our research is between the IWL and other student organizations pictured here. I'll begin by providing a few perspectives from our interviews, which showcase the role of the IWL as a leader and collaborator with the potential to support and uplift the work of other student-led organizations. Current student director of the IWL, Julia Geller, explained, the IWL loves to collaborate. So anytime we think of an event, one of the first questions we ask to follow up is, okay, who should we loop in? I feel like we have a really good standing among a lot of other student organizations on campus, and we are seen as a leader on campus. People respect the work we do because we respect the work they do. Danny Voss explained that the strength in programming at St. Ben's and St. John's is getting to work with and collaborate with folks that you spend a lot of time with. You realize you're working towards similar goals while they may be along different lines, and that's what really brings you together. Lastly, Sydney Robinson shared her vision for the future, for the future of the IWL, saying, I think 20 years forward, I hope the IWL becomes strong enough that they can be part of helping other organizations that help people in the margins or those outside of the spectrum be represented and heard in the same way that the IWL is being respected and heard. 
Survey respondents agreed that the IWL and our campus community benefit from collaboration between student organizations and noted that they want to see more of this connection in the future. Here we've provided a few perspectives, and what's particularly notable is the connection between collaboration with other organizations and more strongly implementing an intersectional lens in IWL programming and events. As noted in one response, it's clear that intersectionality is a value to the IWL, but one way that they could live that out is through partnering with Q+, BSU, ILT, First Gen, JDI, and other campus organizations. Okay, I'm a little nervous, so bear with me. But before I begin, I just wanted to make note of the graph from earlier where we see the number of events attended per semester. While our numbers are small, the percentage of survey takers that said our all of our events were impactful is the majority of survey takers. So that is something to consider if you haven't gone to many events. Um, <clears throat> once again, I'm Ileana, and I'm here to talk about a second theme we discovered while reading through our survey, and that is our style of events. While researching the effectiveness of the IWL, we found that people enjoyed events with guest speakers, as well as events that include a diverse range of topics and presentation styles. In our survey results, we found that students enjoy the when the IWL brings in a guest speaker to talk about the field they are experts in. Guest speakers offer a new perspective and a style of presenting information that draws the audience in. Having a guest speaker adds a level of depth and credibility to the topic that moves it from theories and hypotheticals and textbook scenarios to real experiences and focuses on the severity of social issues. And let's be honest, a lot of us have been conditioned to respect the word of adults more than our peers. Earlier this week, we had our keynote speaker for Women's Month, Wawa Gathru, present her ideas and mission goals. Wawa, for those who couldn't make the event, is a climate storyteller that wants to make the climate movement more relevant and accessible to the younger generation and stop the spread of misinformation surrounding the climate justice movement. She offers insight about her experiences as a first-gen student and a young black woman in STEM and speaks with such passion about her efforts to make a change. <clears throat> Here's a quote from Julia Geller about the effectiveness of having different speakers instead of rotating the same handful of people. She says, I think that that's extremely effective in progressing campus culture. It just can't be the same people over and over and over again saying the same exact thing over and over and over again. It's got to be new voices and new ideas. So I would say that is definitely where the effectiveness of the IWL lies. This mentality helps keep the IWL successful while we partner with other organizations, clubs, and people. In specific, Julia is talking about the joint effort between the IWL and the JDI, the Johnny Development Institute, to answer the question, can men be feminist? In this conversation, we had the Director of Campus Ministry, Aaron Voth, Professor of Gender Studies and Communications, Dr. Shane Miller, and Professor of Political Science, Dr. Pedro Dos Santos. <clears throat> when we work with other students to spread our message, the IWL, the IWI, oh my god, <laughs> the IWL, <laughs> um, is able to reach more people and students. So now we move on to the style that we have found to be successful. We found that the survey takers were most fond of events that felt more like conversations or discussions rather than lectures. Students express that they don't want to feel like they're in another class after an already long day of classes when they go to these events, especially because most of our events are at night. An unfortunate but popular event where students felt the impact of what conversations can have was a Pat Hall protest in which students heard from the IWL staff and fellow peers about their experiences of sexual harassment and assault on campus and the efforts to bring change to this campus after the, re the reveal of a misogynistic and sexist competition. Sex, Milk, and Cookies, on a lighter note, was another fan favorite. This year, a woman from Planned Parenthood came in and spoke with students, and not at students, about topics relating to consent, partner communication, and breaking down misconceptions about sex sex, feeling like an elevated version of the sex talk many of us did not receive. Last event I'll talk about is the Nature Bathing, an event where students stop and take a break from their busy schedule and join their peers to learn about the Japanese practice of relieving stress, improving happiness, and increasing their well-being, while being in contact with the nature, as the title says. <clears throat> Danny Voss says that outdoorsy events have been found to be well-liked and well-attended. She says specifically about nature bathing. It was pretty simple. We just did a really slow meandering walk through the St. Ben's Forest, and it went incredibly well. And every time we did it, we would have like 20 to 30 bennies show up because it was such a great time. Showing that um, activity and conversational events can be as important and educational as our lecture-based events. 
And finally, we found that intersectionality was important to students when coming to and participating in events. Personally, I like to think of intersectionality as a tangled ball of yarn. And if you've never tangled a ball of yarn, lucky you. But in a tangled ball of yarn, each strand is a piece of one's identity, all interwoven and dependent on each other. But Maddie will dive into an academic definition of what it is. Topics or identities that are often forgotten or not talked about have been found to be well-liked by survey takers. For example, we have Bonita Fest, an open mic night for Hispanic Heritage Month that promotes the creativity of students as they perform songs, poems, and play instruments, mainly being about the Latinx and Hispanic experience. Another more recent event during Black History Month was My Hair, My Crown, which offered information about the Crown Act and introduced a black student-made service called Curlbound that helps students on campus find accessible care for their curly hair. And lastly, the feminist, womanist, and mujerista event was highly attended because it gave people a chance to understand different types of feminism and leave the event feeling more seen and connected to themselves. But do remember the words mujerista and womanism, as Maddie again will dive into it. And the Panza Monologues event is a live reading from the book with the same title that focuses on Latina's identity and how body image plays a role in their development. The excerpts are chosen by and performed by different students in whatever style of acting they feel best fits the message of the excerpt. Here's what Sydney Robinson had to say about the event and its inclusion of different identities while seeing her friend perform. I think that was really wonderful to not just have a marginalized voice centered, but like her as a Hispanic woman, stepping up and being able to do that has always been my favorite thing. I will end by saying people love to see their friends perform and on stage, especially when there's a cult cultural significance to it. So the IWL has been successful in promoting that and supported by the testimonies from our survey. Thank you. One thread throughout our presentation so far has been the importance of inclusivity. Our research demonstrated that this is a priority to IWL staff, participants, and alum. As discussed earlier, we know that some students do not feel their gender, racial, ethnic, and sexuality identities are represented in IWL programming. While the connection between representation and inclusivity is complex, um, we know that full inclusion requires intentionality in planning and programming. As Ileana mentioned, we've been using the word intersectionality a lot tonight, so I wanna make sure that we're all on the same page about what that means. It's a term coined by legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw in her 1989 essay, Demarginalizing the Intersections of Race and Sex to Describe the Overlapping of Social Identities Related to Oppression and Discrimination. It was originally used to describe the multidimensionality of black women's experiences of oppression, but has recently been used more widely, both by Crenshaw and other scholars, to describe a lens for understanding the interconnectedness of systems of power and oppression. In recent years, the IWL has approached programming with an increased focus on intersectionality. Both IWL student leaders and program participants have expressed a desire to continue centering intersectionality, not only as an isolated issue, but as a lens central to all programming. Liz Pineda said, something that I hope continues is using a very intersectional approach regardless of your position. A result of this fourth wave feminist movement we're living in, I think, has a lot to do with intersectionality, decolonizing the word feminism, and bringing in voices. Centering intersectionality goes hand in hand with broadening our definition of feminism and moving beyond activism which exclusively or primarily supports white, cisgender, straight, and able-bodied women. Practically, this includes highlighting diverse feminist movements, especially those which center the unique experiences of particular intersecting identities. Sydney Robinson said, I didn't feel seen in feminism, but I do feel seen in womanism, which is the black-centered one that focuses on values and family dynamics and how feminism is represented, or muharista which, that practices how faith and gender deal with relationship dynamics. One of the strengths of IWL is that we've highlighted so far, is the history of celebrating women. But moving forward, we must act with an intentional focus on celebrating all women through centering intersectionality and broadening our definition of feminism. Sydney also said, now that we've prioritized celebrating women, we need to celebrate people who are women plus. So black women involved in this work are Hispanic women, international women, disabled women, and queer women. Another aspect of inclusivity to consider is the question of who is or who is not participating in IWL events. 
There's a delicate balance between creating programming which is approachable for students entering these conversations while remaining relevant to those already involved and educated to some extent. Here are two student responses which illustrate this balance. One said, Programming can be more reflective of the student body, meaning events can be aimed towards students who are just beginning to be involved in gender and diversity conversations. Another said, this year's programming has featured a lot of entry-level lectures on topics related to feminism. While I think these types of events are helpful, I think the audience that comes to IWL events might be ready for more nuanced conversations and topics. Of course, practically navigating this balance is challenging. However, our recommendation for IWL leadership is to consider facilitating a variety of events which are engaging to a variety of different levels of prior experience and knowledge. In conclusion, here are some of our goals that we have written related to inclusivity um, that we want to be a part of bringing about. First, we have some things to continue doing and prioritize even further, including partnering with other campus and community organizations, centering intersectionality, operating with a broad definition of feminism, which includes movements like womanism, the Muharista tradition, and queer feminist liberation, and creating programming which is engaging, approachable, and relevant for students with a variety of backgrounds. Also, there were some ideas served shared in our survey or interviews that I haven't explored in depth but wanted to share. And this includes hiring more students of color and LGBTQ plus students, explicitly highlighting the experiences of queer women, trans women, and all feminine presenting people, intentionally considering accessibility in event planning, and providing leadership opportunities outside of student employment, for example, creating more programs like Heinz. For this period of discussion, we're going to give you a few minutes to talk in your small groups again, but then we wanted to provide an opportunity for broader dialogue between audience members, IWL staff, and our Heinz team. So let's take a few minutes to consider these questions, and then I'll bring us back together as a group so that we can share some ideas with one another. All right, we're gonna kind of open it up to the bigger group. If anyone wants to share anything that they were talking about briefly in their smaller groups of any of the questions. Anyone? If not, that's totally okay. Okay, well then we'll wrap it up from here. So I just wanna give um, everyone an opportunity to give all of these excellent Heinz Scholars another round of applause because they did an amazing job. Um, and thank you so much for coming and listening. Again, this has been amazing for them to be able to showcase um, what they've been working so hard on this entire semester. So thank you so much. I also just want to um, say that this presentation is extra special because this is actually our first Heinz presentation that we've had since COVID. Um, so can you just get another round of applause for that? And I just want to say what an excellent job these eight did in bringing back this special tradition for IWL. Um, so if you are first year and you liked what you saw, you still have an opportunity to become a Heinz Scholar yourself. We, uh, the applications are still open. Don't pay attention to those deadlines on the website. I am still accepting applications. Um, so that you can access that application either on our website or it's also on our link tree on our Instagram. Make sure you're checking that Instagram for more events that we'll have coming up this semester as well. And I also want to send a special congratulations to our new Heinz Scholar Coordinator next year, Ileana. Can you give us a little wave? So come back next year to see what Ileana and the other Heinz Scholars have um, to share as well. So thank you for celebrating Women's History Month with us and being here tonight. Um, have a good night, everyone. Yay. <laughs>